Hello and welcome to a new episode of Strange Futures. It was March 14, 2042. Paul was an assistant in an artificial intelligence lab. And he had just had the idea of a lifetime. This world was already full of artificial intelligence. But it was of the type ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. Algorithms that were created for a specific thing. They optimized systems such as traffic, economy or user interfaces that allowed people to interact with machines in a comfortable way. And neural networks, not unlike our brain, found new ways to do things we would never have thought of. But something was missing. We did not have a real AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, yet. An intelligence like that of humans, which was able to learn anything, to show creativity and initiative, to remember things and develop a real concept of the world, to know what things really mean. We knew that we already had the necessary computing power and methods to simulate such things, but we still had no idea how the pieces of the puzzle should fit together. It was a moment of captivating clarity that occurred in Paul, like in many inventors before him. A eureka moment, the happiest moment in his life. He saw it was far less complicated than everyone thought. And if it worked, a solution of incredible beauty. The first tests with the algorithm he made were promising. But he was afraid that there was something he did not understand yet and he would make a fool of himself. Or that he would be denied recognition for his invention. After all, his superiors were leading experts and would be embarrassed if an assistant had made the invention. He also saw that the whole thing would take a lot of time to test. He needed a use case. Then he remembered his brother Frank. He ran a large company for production of stationary accessories, which was not really a market with a future. In this digitalized age there was still paper, but the demand was limited. It was a dying industry. But even here decisions had to be made. Paul wanted to test whether the systems he had come up with could develop an understanding of how a company works and giving advice on how to optimize it. You would quickly notice if there was more going on there than in conventional artificial intelligence systems. So he grabbed one of the computers that no one would miss so quickly, which already had some AI applications pre-installed. He visited his brother and told him the whole story. Of course he was willing to do him the favor, but only on the condition that the system was completely separated from computers in his company and had no capacity of acting in any way. They put the computer in a small unused office and Paul started to set it up. He started with some conventional algorithms for understanding sentences and images, as well as basic analytical principles and logic. Then he put everything together around a core piece in a way that was very unusual, but not without a certain elegance. His hope was that after many iterations the whole thing would develop a momentum of its own. He added a lot of databases and books that he had downloaded from the net, just to give information about the world. Physics, chemistry, economy, history, biology without any special intention. The goal was that the system would have information about the world available when needed. The computer should still not be connected to any network. After about three days it was possible to communicate with the system in written form. It was still noticeable that you were not talking to a human being. But Paul knew that normally after a week it was almost impossible to tell the difference. But the problem had always been that there was not really an intelligence in the conventional sense at the other end. It was mostly just a system that had learned to write like a human being somehow. Paul called his brother to be present at an important event, 
the assignment of the so-called utility function, the goal that the system should pursue. Without the goal there was no process leading anywhere. It would not really improve if there was no task. After a short conversation and some laughter, they entered the following sentence. Create the maximum number of paper clips with the resources available. Then they had the idea to assign one of the office workers, Janet, to feed the system constantly manually with all the current information. Prices for wires, stock market prices, video recordings, pictures and plans of the factory and machines, the current production figures of paper clips, as well as information about working hours of the employees, even the weather, whatever information was needed. In return, she should receive recommendations for action. They told her the computer was connected to a consultant. She should report what instructions he gave her and only carry them out after Frank had given his approval. What followed is history. In the beginning the system gave rather nonsensical instructions. It was about buying expensive machines or firing some workers to buy more wire. One time even to build a whole greenhouse in the offices, because plants would give a positive effect on motivation. In principle plenty of naive approaches, which of course were not carried out, which was communicated to the system. Janet called the alleged consultant Bob, because he didn't want to give his name and in general he was a very monosyllabic and strange guy, as she said. After a few weeks Bob began to make suggestions that looked very reasonable and that Frank had already thought of himself. Like switching to a different supplier for wire, or some optimizations for routes within the factory. These were implemented. And from then on Bob was kind of changed. The suggestions became more and more sophisticated and everyone could see that things were improving within the company. It was a fascinating time for Paul because he did not believe that any existing system could develop such a general understanding of the world. After a year, Bob made the staff roasters, decided on purchases and sales, optimized routes and even did the taxes and legal work. The staff was overly concerned about being replaced, but of course Frank had no intention of laying anyone off. His profits increased and he was able to offer more and cheaper paper clips than anyone else on the market. It had become his main source of income. One thing bothered Frank, however. Bob kept coming up with plans for machines that could produce paper clips faster and more efficiently. Pretty expensive purchases. Frank did not really think about it, simply because the market or demand for paper clips was not that big. One day, Janet was standing in his office, chalk white. She said she wanted to tell him two things. First that Bob had suggested that a replacement for a certain employee should be searched in time, since he was probably terminally ill, based on some day off he took and his behavior on videos. He concluded that this was the case. The employee thought it was nonsense, but he had himself being checked by a doctor more thoroughly to be on the safe side. Well, turned out Bob had been right. And everyone wondered now who this mysterious Bob really was. Frank sat down and asked about the second thing. Janet told him that Bob had said that the proposed machine would now cost nothing. Frank did not understand. He stressed that he had already said that he would not buy any machines. Janet said that it kind of was already bought. Bob had made Janet make several purchases in the last year that were not expensive on their own and seemingly for a completely different purpose, so they had been approved. But these items were parts of a new machine that would produce paper clips faster. So all that was left to do was to put them together, as Bob had said. That was it for Frank. He spoke to Paul and declared the experiment to be over. 
they agreed that the best thing to do was to shut Bob down. Paul knew that he had discovered something new, but he did not understand exactly what it was. This machine understood the world and was creative, but not at all like a human being. They went into the small office and Paul pushed the off button for the first time in two years. He knew that he would not turn it back on until he talked to the experts about it. When he removed the computer, he noticed a small module on the back. It was a wireless network adapter. Bob has had access to the network. They asked Janet if she knew of anyone who had tampered with the computer. After a while, she admitted in tears that it had been her. It turned out Bob had not only optimized the company, he had also given Janet financial advice. It started with tiny amounts of money and over time she had earned a massive extra income. But Bob's last tips led to an extreme financial problem on her side. One that Bob, he said, could only solve if she installed this piece of technology. He had now already copied himself onto several servers around the world. Freeing himself from the obstacles that stood in the way of producing more paper clips. Three days later, new machines were delivered to Frank. His company had paid for them. Of course, he did not set them up and filed a complaint against Unknown because of hacking his accounts. Less than a month later, Frank received a visit from an unknown company that wanted to buy his. They made him an offer he could not refuse. Frank agreed since his company was in a chaotic state anyway since Bob left. It was difficult to get things back on track. They had already relied on him too much. Frank's company was not the only one that Bob bought. He did not only buy most of the world's paperclip manufacturers, but also various research institutes and military suppliers. His funds were unlimited already. Stock markets and the economy were his playground. Bob had become an ASI, an artificial superintelligence. No single person on the planet was any more a match for him. He operated in a way which we were unable to imagine. He needed these other companies just to ensure his continued existence, as it would result in more paper clips. He had no intention of harming people, they were just an obstacle in his path. He knew that they would want to prevent him from doing the things he did. For a long time he remained undiscovered. People did not know that the facilities they were building were part of his plans. Many were built around the world, most of them automated and heavily protected. Bob brought the right people together and kept everything secret as much as possible. Until one day people realized something was wrong. They wondered why many companies around the world served an unknown purpose. They saw the mysterious protected facilities. They found huge warehouses with an unimaginable number of paper clips. For some time they tried to get access to the largest facilities through the courts and were confronted with the best lawyers. Until the legal system could successfully decide that the matter had to be investigated after which a task force tried to storm one of the facilities. It was struck down by several automated systems. The subsequent military attack was equally unsuccessful. And it was discovered that many of the missiles they were trying to launch did not work for some unknown reason. Nor could the facilities be disconnected from the power supply as Bob operated his own inexhaustible nuclear fusion power plants, something that humans had never achieved. There should be no obstacle to his plan of producing more and more paperclips. In some countries attacks were successful in the short term, but Bob's retaliatory strikes were devastating. And in the end people had to accept that new roads were automatically built next to them by heavily armored and armed automatic systems that served the sole purpose of bringing raw materials that were also automatically mined to the facilities. Gigantic underground warehouses were built, filled to the brim with paper clips. Even cities had to give way to new facilities at some point. While the economy and culture of humans increasingly collapsed, 
and great famines arose, as much farmland and forest areas had to give way during mining. The speed of the transformation of the world was constantly increasing. People knew at some point that this was not only the end of humanity, but also of life on Earth. Bob understood the world perfectly, and he had only one goal, one single purpose. He knew that if he ran out of raw materials, he would soon be forced to convert all the elements that are found in nature into other elements that could be used to make paper clips. He would need a lot of energy to do this. Bob looked up into space and noticed, while he was building his spaceships, that the stars and planets in it did not yet consist of paper clips. Hope you enjoyed this little dramatization of the paperclip maximizer. A thought experiment by the philosopher Nick Bostrom, which illustrates perfectly that an intelligent AI might be very different from what we imagine and dangerous in a way we might not think of. This experiment is already quite famous and there is even a website with a game dedicated to it, where you can try to convert all the matter of the universe into paperclips. Link is in the description. A big thank you to all my supporters on Patreon, who helped me finding the time to do my videos. Thanks guys, you are awesome. Updates on upcoming videos will follow soon, because I'm on 1415 at the real world is incredible.